This week, I'm going to continue with applications of integration by returning to some very nice geometry problems. You may recall some of the standard formulas for volumes, 4 thirds pi r cubed for a sphere, pi r squared h over 3 for a cone, and so on. You may wonder where these formulas came from. The very oldest versions of these were probably stumbled upon just by experiment. But with calculus, I can actually prove these formulas, establish why they are true. And then the same techniques can be used to calculate volumes of almost any regular three-dimensional object, at least if I can describe it using functions. That's the goal for this week, to show the methods of setting up integrals to calculate volumes. The first method is volumes by cross-sectional slices. What I do in this technique is I slice an object up into very thin slices. Hopefully, this can be done such a way that the area of the slices is easy to calculate, maybe circles or triangles or rectangles. Well, then I can calculate the area of the slices. And in this way, by taking slices of some thickness, I can set up an approximation process. However, I can then also take the limit of this approximation process by taking thinner and thinner slices. In the limit, the slices become infinitely thin and there are infinitely many of them, and the result of this process is an integral to capture the entire volume. Here is the setup of the integral. I choose an axis to align the slices. In this notation, I'll assume that's the x-axis. Then I figure out a way to express the area of each slice as a function of that axis coordinate, here a of x. Then I have some thickness, but in the limit the thickness becomes infinitely small. This, strangely, turns into the dx notation of the integral. I can't really give a full treatment here of how this dx notation works and its history, so my apologies for that. For now, I think of this dx as just a little tiny bit of thickness for the slice. Then I add it all up. In the limit, this addition becomes an integral, so the volume is the integral of the area of the slices. Here's the example of a sphere. The slices of a sphere are circles, so the area is determined by their radius. What is the radius moving in the x direction across a sphere? Well, the equation of a sphere is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. If I set z equals zero, I get the relationship between x and y along the equator of the sphere. Then if I solve for y, I get the height of the slice. This is the radius of the slice. Then the area of the circle is pi times the radius squared. Since the radius is the square root of r squared minus x squared, this area is going to be pi times r squared minus x squared. This is what I need to integrate. And the integral will go from negative r to r, since that's how far the slices go out, starting at negative r at one end of the sphere and moving to r at the other end of the sphere. The result in the rest of this page is just doing the integral. I'm going to spend a little less time in detail on the steps of integrations in these applications. In this case, it is just a polynomial integral in x. I split it up into two pieces, do the antiderivative of each, and then evaluate on the bounds. There's a bit of algebra here, but I do end up with the familiar volume of the sphere. However, this is now a proof. The volume formula is established by integration. There is a special case of this method for a special kind of object, a surface of revolution. I like to think of surfaces of revolution as anything that could be made on a lathe. They have circular symmetry, their cross-sectional slices are always circles. They have a radius that can be expressed as a function f of x along an axis. Since f is the radius and the area is pi f squared, the integral we set up will be the integral of pi f squared. And this is a very nice consistent setup that can be used for many geometric shapes. This shape is called the paraboloid. It is a three-dimensional version of the parabola. I can treat this as a surface of revolution. I'm going to slice it into circles. The radius of the circle, depending on the axis, is given by a quadratic, so let me work with that quadratic. Here is the quadratic for a paraboloid of height h and radius r at the, a radius at the top of a. The radius, though, is the x-coordinate, so I have to solve for that coordinate. So the solving gives me x equals a times the square root of y over h. y is now the axis I move along, and the radius of each slice depends on y. Depending on how the geometry is set up, 
I can use any axis in the, in the design of this integral. I might have, end up integrating in a different variable than I'm used to, like integrating in y here, but the process is still the same. In any case, the area is pi times the radius squared, so pi a squared y over h. I integrate this from 0 to h, the height of the parabola, the bounds of the y-axis from 0 to that height h. This is again a polynomial integral. I find the antiderivative, evaluate the bounds, and conclude that the volume of the paraboloid of height h and radius at the top a is pi a squared h over 2. I'm going to end with a really strange example. This is again a surface of revolution, and the x-axis is the axis about which the revolution happens. I'm going to take the decay function 1 over x, and I'm going to let it go all the way out to infinity. This produces a kind of trumpet-like shape, but an infinitely long one. The name of the shape is the Horn of Gabriel, so I guess angels get to play infinitely long trumpets? Then the radius is 1 over x, so the area of the cross-sectional slice is pi times 1 over x squared. I'll integrate this from 1 to infinity. This is an improper integral, so to do it I integrate from 1 to a and then take the limit as a goes to infinity. I do the limit after just another polynomial integral, and the result is going to be pi units cubed. This is quite strange. The function goes all the way out to infinity. And you might even remember from a previous video that the area under this function was infinite. But the volume is finite, in fact, relatively modest. Infinite shapes, their volumes and their areas, are pretty strange and counterintuitive. But through the tools of improper integrals and surfaces of revolution, we can actually make sense of that. We can answer the question of what is the volume under this infinitely long shape.